Jampa Lung Tog. Thank you for being here and starting with those images. You were in uh, in uh, this particular monastery and you know the monastery. Yes, yes. So this is in the south of India. Exactly. In the Karnata, Karnataka. Karnataka state. State. Yes. And uh, we're talking that you know for sure the the, the road from Goa <laughs> to to Mungod, in fact. In Mungod, yes. Mungod. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, the the beautiful road the, near the ocean. Yes, and, yes. Um, the flowers. Yes, a lot of flowers everywhere. Very, very nice. Mm -hmm. We have here the wheel. It's yes. a powerful symbol in the yes. Buddhist tradition. Yes. Uh, it's an uh, eight-spoked wheel and uh, having uh, various symbol symbolic uh, meanings. And it uh, represents the teachings of the Buddha in general. Like you see it also on the top before with yeah. these two deer. Two deer. It's yeah. in the center is also the wheel. It's the, the symbol wheel. for Buddha's teachings. Buddha's teaching, the symbol for Buddha. This is Master Jetsongkapa. A very important master. It's maybe the most famous master, most important master of the whole history of Tibet. Whole history. And here we are in the uh, Garden Shatsen Norling School. Yes. So in, in the, in the uh, um, yard of the, the, uh, the school, we may find uh, the, the image of the, the most important Lama. I think this is the debate ground, debate where ground they also. have a seat mm -hmm. and uh, in the background they have uh, the images of these great masters. Painted. Yeah, yeah, the debate. We will come again to this, uh, this very important subject. Very simple way of uh, of uh, uh, teaching. A ratful, a ratful uh, deity is, here. Is a protector appearance. Protector. The school. The, the building um, here, we are on the fourth floor. There are two floors. And um, I think children uh, from eight, ten, ten years. Yes, yes. Ten years. They are uh, learning, um, chanting, and, uh, and with loud voice. Uh, they're mostly memorizing texts. Memorizing. So they have to memorize quite a lot of texts, also to be admitted to common prayers. And then the study texts, the a root version, a condensed version of the study texts are also memorized. And I understood that each day they have to memorize three pages. It's possible. It possible. depends on so the, their intelligence, their mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm.
maybe we are, we are here in the high school uh, almost. It's more advanced class mm -hmm. looking at the age of the disciples. But there is a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge to be learned in these uh, schools. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, uh, in each classroom, we may find this, uh, uh, pic those pictures, the, the masters. Yeah, the masters, these masters of the transmission lineage, important masters of Buddhist history. And here is again Master Chetsongkapa with his two disciples. Yes, and here the, the students are, uh, are living. Uh, they are, have a very busy, busy schedule. This is a break, I think. They have quite a schedule, yes. Quite a schedule. From, yes. from morning to night. Tonight, yes, yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Yes, uh, 11 o'clock it was in, in, uh, in a night and all uh, the monastery was full of the sound of the, 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 the students um, chanting, chanting and, and yeah, reciting. Reciting, yeah, reciting, reciting, reciting. Uh, in order not to uh, forget the texts that they had memorized, they recite them. I, I, 11 o'clock p.m. it was like a rumor. Yes, yes. 11 o'clock, what yeah. we are doing on 11 o'clock? We are eating popcorn maybe yes. and uh, zapping. Yes, yes. And they were like this reciting. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable Gelong Jampalung Tog, for, uh, for the chance of meeting you again and, and um, presenting us the, uh, the um, essence of, of education uh, in uh, Buddhist, the Buddhist tradition and Buddhist school and the, the, the relation between ourselves and the reality. Yeah, and uh, mm, we have the chance uh, for of uh, a new edition, beautiful edition of the da Dharma treasures of the venerable master Geshe Rapte Impoche. Yes. Um, it was your master, exactly, and um, allowed me to 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 present uh, uh, the the picture of the the master. So yes, Geshe yes. Rapte Impoche. And we have here. This is his incarnation. incarnation. <laughs> At a young age. Young age. Now it's 20, 29, 29 years old. Yes. And uh, maybe you, you, you please please explain to us. Oh, this is a sta very famous statue of Master Che Tsongkhapa, uh, which uh, has a specific name and has a specific history and is considered a very, very precious statue. It was quite old. Quite old. Venerable Jan Palung Tok, please uh, mm, present us a little bit what uh, means the debate in... Uh, it's connected with the uh, mm, Venerable Master Geshe Rapten and in fact to the title of Geshe. And maybe we'll arrive then uh, of uh, the, the, the degrees of, uh, of uh, Tibetan uh, <coughs> Um, um, Tibet, the degrees of uh, what the, of the schools, and so what mean PhD equivalent of PhD? Uh, please, sorry, of uh, not asking quite precise. So, mm -hmm. debate and the uh, venerable Geshe Rapten. So this uh, system of debate goes back in the history of Buddhism uh, very, very long, and. It actually the source are Buddha's own request to his disciples not just to believe him out of admiration for him, but uh, to judge his teachings by precisely analyzing them for their value. Like somebody who buys gold will analyze the gold whether it is pure gold before he pays, buys it and pays for it. So Lord Buddha's uh, teachings need to be analyzed to get a deep understanding of them. And uh, this uh, capacity of Buddha requesting everybody to analyze everything is also known as the lion's roar. Lion's roar. The lion's roar. Wow, when the, what when a, the, the powerful image. Exactly. When the lion roars, all the other animals are quiet and nobody dares. Just one powerful voice. Exactly. Yeah. And why? Uh, does Buddha give such a request to his disciples because he's 
he knows that his explanations correspond perfectly to reality. So there's no fear in proclaiming that. And also the means to uh, develop the mind is to understand this reality step by step. So Buddha's teachings can be considered as an introduction to reality, to the most subtle levels of reality, step by step, a very structured method first to develop some understanding and then step by step develop better qualities of mind, to improve the capacity of mind to understand. And with improved capacity to understand, then further and further verification of the Buddha's teachings are uh, available. Now the door for us to understand anything uh, that is not directly accessible to our outer senses is only logic. And we as human beings have a very good capacity of thinking logically, analytically. This is what really what distinguishes us from all other types of beings. And with this capacity we can analyze. But now analysis depends on the proper use of language. Because our thoughts follow our words. And so this system of debate has been uh, used for centuries to train the mind in a way of logical thinking, of logical formulating. And uh, Master Geshe Rab Nimbuchi, he was he entered this, one of these great monasteries, was Sera Monastery, uh, at the age around 89 of 19, I think. And uh, then there learned this system of debate. And very quickly it became obvious that he had extraordinary qualities in understanding, grasping the meaning. So very soon it became obvious that he was an exceptional being that quite uh, out of free will, free capacity had taken this birth and then chose to be among these disciples. Because, of course, we learn primarily from our teachers, but then to really uh, gain a deeper understanding, we need our companion students. And debate is a very powerful means to step by step analyze every point. And when you debate with a partner who himself has a good me understanding, then you, the profit is enormous. So such a being like Ashirab Nimbuchi appearing among these disciples, debating with them, is uh, really the appearance of Buddha helping the disciples step by step to gain deeper knowledge. And so he became known as a person of very uh, a profound grasping of the meaning of Buddha's teachings and so begin, people start to ask him for teachings, for lessons, which he then also gave, and more and more would come. And so that is the actual proper way of becoming a teacher in Buddhism, like people noticing the qualities and asking for the, uh, for the explanations. And uh, then there is a whole program of studies which at that time in Tibet, compared to our studies today, is kind of unbelievable. Actually, this is a study program of 20 years, where they memorize texts first, before they learn the meaning. Because without mastering the words, how do you want to master any meaning? So first they memorize the text and master the words, and then the teacher gives the meaning, and then they debate on it to really explore the very deep avenues of every aspect of the meaning. In our in Euro European culture to memorize uh, hundreds of pages, I think this is uh, 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 usual for actors, yes, for example, yes. but not for everyone. No. So um, you know by heart a text yes. and after gradually you improve your uh, capacity to to grasp the meaning exactly i know that debating is the most important part in in the sy uh, system yeah. of education and it it's can it starts i think when we are 12 or 4, four 14 years old something like that oh, no 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 they start with six seven six seven yes 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 and you have mm -hmm. one of these little guys debating with you, he can bring you to a point where you have to say that red is green within, within about five minutes. Just us not being trained in logical thinking, 
and they being trained, they'll do anything with you with a yeah. couple of steps of logic. Wow. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Very, can, can you, uh, you give us an example for, uh, of, of debating, of, of logic, uh, logical uh, ways of, of uh, even um, changing the reality? <laughs> well, I uh, only experienced this effect with their debates, but I didn't really uh, catch on to the details. But I can give an example which is easily understood, which contains the main points of such logical process. You have one Please. person standing, mm -hmm. another one sitting. Yeah. The standing one is allowed to say one sentence and then claps into its hands. The sentence must have a clear characteristic of a subject, a quality of the subject and can have a reason. And then the sitting person has to reply. And he has to reply either by saying yes, I agree, or by saying the reason is not established, or asking for a reason if none was given, or saying the implication is wrong. He can say only that. And then the standing person has to formulate the next sentence according to the reply. So we'll try that on a very simple example. Please. And uh, so the, the standing person may say, a table, a subject, it follows that it is an animal because it has four legs. And if I'm sitting, I may say no. Uh, no, 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 you cannot just say no. You say yes, which yes. probably you will not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can say the reason is not established or the implication is not uh, given. So when asking untrained people, what would you reply? They easily may say the reason is not established. Now let's say our child also replies, the reason is wrong. Mm -hmm. Then you say, what is the reason? And then he has to formulate the reason. The reason is, this table, uh, it has four legs, or it follows that it has four legs. Now this is the reason given. Which, which is, is perfect. Which is perfectly true. So the reason is established. Yes. So what's wrong with this sentence? Mm -hmm. The implication is wrong. So he will say the implication is wrong in the next attempt to save himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the standing person will say, will say, what is the implication? And the implication is, if something has four legs, it is necessarily an animal. That was the implication of this uh, sentence. And then, of course, uh, it becomes obvious that this is not true. And then he will say, well, we are talking about two groups of phenomenon, about phenomenon with four legs and phenomenon called animals. And what is the relationship between these two groups of phenomena? And then there are replies like they are contradictory, which means there is never anything which is both, the one and the other. It can either be the one or the other, but it's never both. Or it has a three-point relationship, which means it can be the one but not the other, the other not the one, or both. Or then they, there are various ways of doing this with three points and four points. A four point will be something that is neither nor, that is both, that is the one but not the other, and the other and mm -hmm. not the one. So this would be the proper reply here with regards to the phenomena with four legs and animals. Mm -hmm. Then he would say, give me an example of something which is both. Then the answer would be, for example, a dog. Dog has four legs and is an animal. So it has both groups. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of something which is neither nor. It's a human being. It doesn't have four legs and is not an animal. Give me something which is an animal and does not have four legs. Bird. Give me an example of something which has four legs and is not an animal. The table. So this is on a very simple uh, basis just to get the structure of such process of debating. Then they go to more subtle things, right from the beginning, quite profound. It's not easy to follow um, all this uh, argument or, or the logic, even from this uh, simple example, for a, a usual European mind, I think. Exactly. But if we think that the subject of debating are mm, such as um, the, the reality, the yeah. impermanence, the cause and effect, and so on, I think uh, 
we are dealing uh, with a kind of, of chess table with <laughs> many, many possibilities of combination and of, of movements between the, the debating partners. It uh, is a very uh, clearly aimed process at discerning what exists and what not exists. Because our main problem is our projecting, which happens all the time. As soon as we see something, we see a person, actually what we see is just color and shape, which means the color and shape of the body. Is the person the body? Yes. If you ask there, we'll, we'll have to say, no, the person is not the body. Yeah. But we have the impression, we see the person. We're not aware of perceiving the person as a, as a secondary kind of step after having perceived the body of the person. Beyond the sense perception, in fact. Yes. yes. First is the sense perception, which perceives the, the body. Then. And then there comes the thought, this is this person. Mm -hmm. We are not aware of this process. And uh, we are under the impression that the person exists exactly as it appears to us, which is not at all the case. And this wrong attitude is the basis for the negative attitudes of mind, like hatred, desire. Like when we see a, a pretty person, we think this, this object by itself is pretty, I need it for my happiness. So the beauty has to be redefined. So a beautiful uh, woman, for example, it's an object of desire mm, because of its perception, perceptive qualities, not bef because of its inner qualities or beyond sense perception qualities. Exactly. We project a quality of inherent happiness or source mm -hmm. of happiness into it. We project the quality also of beauty. Mm -hmm. If you look, where is the beauty? Is it in the nose? Is it in the face? Or is it in the ears? You cannot point to anything. Oh, the whole thing is beautiful. Yeah. Look more carefully, it's not that beautiful. After all, if you just open your eyes, then it becomes more evident how we are subject to projections. <laughs> so we project mm -hmm. this, and it just seems like an object of source of happiness, so we want it. Deconstructing the projection and expanding in this way, so deconstructing, re retiring the projection means to mo much, mo much more clear uh, making the difference between re external realities and in inner reality and expanding the consciousness in yes. a way. Uh, this is the main subject of Buddhism, to understand what is there really as outer reality existing and what is only my projection. And it comes through four schools of philosophy to ever increasing le levels of subtlety. Mm. Until at the end there doesn't remain much of an outer world existing subjectively. <laughs> So or objectively, I think one has to say. The question is, is there, there an objective reality uh, which exists independent of the subject? The answer one will probably give is, at, in higher levels, no. No. There is only existence uh, in an interdependent mm -hmm. process of object, organ and mind coming together. So it is always something that only can be stated uh, on the basis of interdependence. But if I am not aware, for example, and I am not perceiving this table, this table continue to exist because you may perceive it, or everybody here in the studio, or our viewers? This question already pre uh, kind of um, proposes that there is an independently existing table, yeah. the way you formulate it. Yes. 
And uh, that very point would be denied in philosophy. Let's take it from another point of view. The way I perceive this table, does it correspond to the way you perceive it or anybody else perceives it? Or does every being that looks at this table have, has, have its own specific I, uh, kind of impression of the table? Each one with, with his table. With his table. So thousands of tables is not uh, an identical form, no. different forms. No, no. So what is the table then finally by itself? Does it exist independent, independently of a perceiver or not? These are the questions that are being uh, asked. And the reason why this is so important is that uh, on the basis of our projections in us arise such emotions like desire, hatred, jealousy, yeah. which <coughs> disturb the mind completely, which leave imprints like seeds in the mind which ripen in experience of suffering. So if one wants to liberate oneself completely from suffering, one has to cut through these layers of projections. If it exists an independent reality, this means that we are not responsible of constructing the reality. That, of course not, no. So, if we know that we are projected and constructing the reality, this means that we may change our perception of seeing this, so this means that we may change the world. On two levels, yes. First of all, if one can cut through these projections with regards to oneself, these disturbing factors leave the mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, there arises a natural pure happiness in the mind. That's what we're always lo longing for, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if these disturbing factors are removed forever, then this is a state of happiness that remains also forever. So one's own world is completely changed. And indirectly it has a great effect on the world of the others, because we are all very closely interlinked. We always exist due to the activities of others, thanks to others. So oneself um, uh, improving so dramatically one's own way of existing kind of pulls the others also to uh, closer to such a solution. Is, the implications are very deep. For example, in negotiation for peace, there, the enemy always project hatred and the, the bad object on the other one. So if, for example, I'm, I'm uh, in, with much passion, I said, he's a bastard and so on. In that moment, I cannot discriminate and see that I create that reality. <laughs> of course not. But this, maybe it's become like a vicious circle because the one who uh, received this kind of message will continue to, to be much more aggressive and so so it is, the practice has to be uh, um, very, very continuous and profound to, 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 see, to see this. I've heard the great masters say, you can come together and talk about peace as much as one wants. In order to create peace, you have to start creating peace in your yes, own mind. Right. As long as you don't do that, whatever treaties you make, mm -hmm. there will not be peace. Yeah. But developing peace in one's own mind, which means removing these factors, first of all, just calming them so they don't mm -hmm. come out so frequently, so obviously, will make you a much more agreeable person towards the others. Mm -hmm. So just the surrounding that you're living in will feel much more at ease yeah. and uh, appreciate your presence. Mm -hmm. Your, if you speak a few meaningful words, it will lead them to deeper understanding. So like that, more and more real uh, calm states of mind and happy states of mind will spread from oneself. That's the way to uh, bring peace to the beings. And this starts 
in fact, from Buddha Manjushri. So that we have here is the Buddha with the sword. The sword, the logic creates structure. It's the tool conducing us to, to the peace, the sword. Interesting, because the sword is connected with um, with war, with the warrior. <laughs> yes, yes. It's Not the, with, with peace. It is the uh, knowledge that can distinguish exactly between what is projection and what is reality. And this is not at all easy. Like we can easily mm -hmm. talk about perceiving the person and this, uh, on the basis of the body and this is projection, but it's very vague. Okay. And such a vague knowledge is not enough to remove the faults. You need the knowledge that with utmost precision understands what is reality and what is just projection. For example, our science measures, analyzes, comes up with theories. What is the meaning of theory? Yes. It's the meaning that I think it's like that, but I'm not completely sure. So scientists are very honest. It is a knowledge with very, which very often corresponds to some aspects of reality, but it is still has a, an aura of vagueness. And this is not good enough. You need a perfect knowledge of this is and this is not. Only then you can remove the false, only then the mind can advance to this perfect development. And that's yeah. the meaning of the sword, really mm -hmm. cutting between existence and non-existence. The sacred war connected with the sword of the Manjushri is the war with the uncertainty, the war with the project, projection. It's an inner war. Inner war. It's a war against one's own faults of the mind. And as you said very precisely, it is a war against one's own projections. The core of education is uh, uh, connected with um, projected reality. Very deep psychology in the core of the Tibetan education, we may see. You can say that uh, the teachings of Buddha are the, an extraordinarily profound psychology because it all deals with the mind, the qualities of the mind, the possibilities of the mind, the faults of the mind, and of methods how to overcome the faults. Mm -hmm. So if you call it all a science of mind, which I think is the actual meaning of psychology, uh, that suits perfectly. And uh, tonight in uh, Spirit University, we had the chance to hear you in a conference about those themes of the mind, reality, and so on. Uh, you've told me about uh, Avalokiteshvara. We have here on the wall uh, the, the great um, deity of compassion. So he is, uh, have, has four, four arms and two of them are in a prayer position and you've, you, uh, you've told me that he kept, kept something in her hand. As a jewel. Hand. As a jewel fulfilling the needs of all beings. And uh, it has also further meaning, it's also the jewel of uh, compassion. A jewel of a compassion. A jewel, yeah, a jewel yeah. of compassion. Yes. But it's also the jewel that fulfills mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. happiness, the needs of all beings. This jewel, it's connected in, in a way with the heart, as I understand. So, uh, having compassion for, for all sentient beings, a matter of, of a heart. We discussed before a matter of the cognit our cognitive capacities. So, it's interesting, we have co cognition, so the sword of the logic, but in connection with, so Manjushri, Manjushri is here. <laughs> Avalokiteshvara is here in our heart, in a way? From a Western point of view, one may easily come to such a uh, description. Typically, for, typically for... <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it has its meaning. Yeah. So we associate uh, an intellectual understanding always with the head. Now, in fact, uh, the understanding that is needed goes far beyond that. Mm -hmm. 
It is first an understanding one gains from the teachings. One understands the words of the Master. Then one has to reflect on them. Then one finds, slowly, slowly approaches the meaning of these words. But still, that is not enough. Then you have to develop the intellectual understanding on the basis of such precise analysis, like it is uh, trained in the debate, to a perfect intellectual understanding of what is and what is not. Mm -hmm. That is still not enough. Then you have to enhance the quality of the mind, the power of the mind, to overcome this image of what is and what is not. It remains an image at that point. Every intellectual understanding is an image. So first this image has to be made perfect. Mm -hmm. And then when this image is perfect, this has to, still the image itself has to be overcome so that the mind directly sees the reality. And at that point, the faults of the mind leave the mind forever, not mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And then whether this is happening at the level of the heart or of the, of the head is, is not a question. Actually, the mental processes are uh, happening all over the body and there yeah. are specific centers. Mm -hmm. Of course, the vague state of mind has its center in the head and other states of mind have the center in other places of the body. And compassion, the state of mind uh, also, we very easily associate with the heart, good heart, kind heart, mm -hmm. which is also very meaningful. It is a factor of mind, wishing that no being suffer. This is also developed to an extreme point of perfection on the basis of understanding. So understanding the close connection we all have with every being, one sees that actually one is indebted deeply to every being. And then out of this understanding, logical understanding of this enormous debt we have towards every being, mm -hmm. then one sees there is no other way but to develop the qualities to help every being. And so this is the compassion of the uh, Avalokiteshvara. Yes, and which again is a comp the whole being is compassion. So it's not no longer just a question of heart, it's the whole appearance of the body, yeah. every aspect is mm -hmm. an, a facet of compassion. A typical uh, European remark, splitting uh, head and, and the heart. But even in, in, for example, in our Orthodox tradition, they said that you have to, to, to lower your mind and, and, and come in, in, and to rest in the heart. So it's a metaphor of this uh, integral, exactly. integral uh, experience, realizing, re realizing in th this is to, to live, yes. to, to feel it. Yes, it's very, very profound, very, very suitable, mm -hmm. this image also. We have so Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, and then Mm, Vajrapani. Yes. Vajrapani, the power, yes. the fire, the power. How can we, we translate this? In well, these uh, wrong states of mind, they're very powerful in us. Mm -hmm. uh, not easy to get rid of them. So you need a power that overcomes those. So it is these states of mind that mm -hmm. understand reality perfectly, mm -hmm. that are powered by the deep compassion that have the power to overcome all of these faulty states of mind. And this is also appearing in the form of a deity, of a, a manifestation of the Buddha, not as a human being uh, specifically depicted, but as a, uh, as a deva or a deity. And uh, this is called Vajrapani. Mm. Lots of power there, lots of power. There are symbols who may guide our, our uh, uh, life. We were discussing before um, um, being in the studio about reality. So you said that if a child uh, wished to, to stop the rain, uh, it's better not to, to pray to a cloud, no. but to a much powerful... Uh, those are, for example, a, a powerful entities, de deities. So to pray to Vajrapani means what, in fact? Well, you are approaching the power of the Buddha. So the uh, Buddha Shakyamuni is one appearance of the many, many Buddhas that exist. And uh, they are not, even if their appearance for our eye at the moment is not available, they are there all the time. Mm -hmm. They are active all the time. 
So uh, the people, of course, of the times when Buddha Shakyamuni lived had very spe special prerequisites to perceive such an extraordinary being. But in our times they also appear as human beings, more difficult to recognize them. And they are active in many, many ways all the time. So understanding their qualities, their existence, having deep faith in them, devotion to them, then it is a, an integral part of all Buddhist practice to invoke their compassion, to request their compassion, to invoke their wisdom, request it, and invoke their power to bless us, to help us, because we are so weak. And so primarily one invokes their qualities in order to overcome one's negative states mm -hmm. of mind. There we need all of the power. But then for very special situations or uh, necessities, uh, where you really wish some uh, benefit for others, you, it is perfectly all right to invoke their power, please help this poor being. I am so weak, I cannot do it. You are so powerful, please help them, please help me to be able to help those. This is done very frequently. From the perspective of the, um, the discussion about re, re inner and outer reality, if, for example, I pray to Guru Rinpoche or to, I don't know, uh, Vajrapani, I pray to an inner or outer reality. In our present situation, to an outer reality. Our outer yes. reality. To another person. So, s different and separated by me. So yes. I have to ask him because yeah. we are not connected in a way. We are connected, but we don't have these qualities. Mm -hmm. It is another being that has attained these qualities and as we do in everyday life and we have trouble, we go to somebody that can help us. Yeah. That's, yeah. We, we seek for the most powerful person that mm -hmm. we can reach to help us and that's exactly what one does. Yes, so in, in the first place and we are praying to an exterior yes. uh, reality, deity. Yes. And this means that uh, th there are some other possibilities to relate with the uh, with deity. Well, there are many ways to relate to a deity, or as be it Buddha himself, or be the appearances mm -hmm. of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. It's uh, visualizing them has a very powerful effect on one's mind, a very mm -hmm. calming effect mm -hmm. and very uh, supporting effect for developing the mind. And then reciting words that have been blessed or given, which are actually a, a verbal manifestation mm -hmm. of these deities, which mm -hmm. are called mantras, mm -hmm. which are like Om Mani Padme Hum, is mm -hmm. the verbal manifestation mm -hmm. of Avalokiteshvara, mm -hmm. of the compassion mm -hmm. of all of the Buddhas. Mm -hmm. So by reciting this Om Mani Padme Hum, mm -hmm. this will, in on the one hand, enhance one's own mm -hmm. uh, compassion, slowly, slowly, mm -hmm. and at the same time invoke the compassion of all of the Buddhas. Mm -hmm. We are here again in uh, Garden Shatse Monastery in the, uh, the new and uh, big prayer hall. And uh, here it's the picture of a uh, lama. This is Captain Tijang Doji Chang. This is one of the really the very most exceptional master of the past century. And uh, the very teacher of His Holiness Dalai Lama. Yeah. So uh, he is uh, such a master of such exceptional integrity and quality that he became like the, the teacher of m most of the great masters uh, of his time. And we are in the middle of a purification puja. We may see here the chanting master. Yes. And uh, also has an, a secondary um, help. Yes. And here is uh, Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni. This is Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni. Yes. And in the, in the front... This is a picture of Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama. on the throne. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's impressive to be there during uh, the, the ceremony. Um, the, the verb, the power of the word and, and the, the power of, of 500 monks praying. Yes. Here, the Manjushri, the yes. sword. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. In the center, what you saw before, this is a form of Avalokiteshvara with a uh, thousand arms. Thousand arms. Yes, very Each special. Each arm can help 
uh, a person, so oh. thousands of arms. Yes, thousands of arms, exactly. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Sometimes we, we feel the need to have more than two arms, so oh, this yes. Is, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, to help uh, each and every, every yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah. Like a mother. It uh, is really the compassion of the mothers uh, multiplied towards each and every being and also multiplied in its intensity. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the source of quality is like the compassion of a mother towards mm -hmm. a child. That uh, kind of uh, potentiality mm -hmm. each one of us has mm -hmm. and that can be developed and when it's brought to perfection mm -hmm. then it manifests in the form yes. of and our Lukteshwara. And here the jelling uh, this is the uh, the conch shell. Mm -hmm. This is just the conch shell they are blown. It's actually just the, the house of a shell. Shell, yes. With, with a hole made on the one side, mm -hmm. and this is blown during uh, mm -hmm. ceremonies. Mm -hmm. The gyaling are more like an oboe. Oh, an uh, oboe, oboe, yes. They look yes, like an oboe. Yes, it's con uh, yeah, yeah. also used at such ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Gyaling. Gyaling, that's called Gyaling. Gyaling. Exactly. The, the G in Tibetan is G. Uh, they have G's also. G? And here is Gya, Gyaling. Gyaling. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have Ja, Ja also. Ja. Yeah? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They have Ga, Gya, Ja, all of those. Maybe one of the few sounds they don't have is F. F? F, they don't have an F. Interesting. Yes. Um, you now, after a few years of learning Tibetan, you may speak Tibetan without an accent. So, is without an accent is not so easy. Mm -hmm. It will take. There are some Westerners that speak Tibetan really with a, an accent of a well-educated person of Lhasa. Some when they have their main. A company with people from the east, they have an accent of the eastern Tibetan regions. Mm -hmm. And then to get rid of one's western accent of whatever language one comes from, that's also not so easy. And I think you have to leave uh, and to leave in, uh, the, 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 uh, any uh, sign of European language and to be there only with the, in the Tibetan language and also to grasp and to, to to, to have the, the, the kind of topics and, and accent, yeah. Um, you, you use now the Tibetan language daily, on daily yes, basis? Yes, of course. It's a, a language that has been transformed intentionally to bring Buddhism from India to Tibet. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very wise minister that has uh, created a new script on the basis of the Indian script of those times. And then within a very fairly short time of a few hundred years, they created words perfectly corresponding to the Sanskrit expressions. Mm -hmm. And the reading today, Tibetan translations of the original Sanskrit text is amazing. The precision also of the vocabulary. For example, Buddha, they don't, didn't take the word Buddha and just used it as a foreign word. They took the meaning of Buddha. Buddha, Buddha in Sanskrit means awakened and blossomed. Blossomed. Blossomed, like a flower, completely blossomed. Awakened from the sleep of ignorance mm. and blossomed all the qualities to perfection. And they used two Tibetan syllables, sang ye. Sang means uh, purified, so awakened. And ye means increased, blossomed. So they took the meaning of the Sanskrit word and created a new Tibetan uh, word. And they did that with just about everything. So you can even go back to Sanskrit expressions from Tibetan names. And it, uh, so the language has been used by the greatest masters of the past thousand years, thousand five hundred years, to express this deep philosophy of Buddhism on a very, very precise level. So just learning the language and using it is a key access to this philosophy, a very precise access. Even Tibetan colloquial language, daily language, contains many aspects of Buddhist philosophy. For example, they will never say, I wash myself. If you try to say that, it sounds completely crazy. 
I wash myself? No, you cannot say I wash myself in Tibetan. What you say is I wash my body. I'm not the body. Yeah, you're washing your body, not washing yourself. What is yourself? The person. Are you washing the person? Indirectly, yes. What you're washing directly is your body. You're not washing your mind. Deep implication. We are here uh, captured in the network of uh, w w the word signification. Exactly. So myself, mind, myself, mind, and um, consider this every day. I wash my teeth. Yes. The yes. teeth. Yeah, yeah. In Tibetan, so I wash the the hair. How they say? Uh, just washing hair. Washing hair. I wash hair. Wash hair, wa wash, wash hair. hair yeah. you, don't, you can even lift the eye away. Okay, away. this body, washing. this body is correct yeah. in Tibetan. Yeah, yeah. No, my body. No, we say super. Yeah, yeah. They usually say body. Just washing body. Washing body. I will go wash body. Everybody knows you're washing your own body. <laughs> Otherwise, you say I will wash him or his body. I am eating. I am feeding this body. Uh, it means uh, I eat. Uh, kala means, uh, actually it literally means hand mouse. Food is hand mouse. Whether you have your hand and you put it in your mouth. Hand, hand mouse. Hand mouse yeah. is the word for food. C can you please uh, tell again in Tibetan to, to hear the beauty of the sound? Uh, kala. Kala. Sagiye. Kala sagi. Sagi ye. Sagi ye. Yeah, yeah. So this means hand mouth. mouth. Kala is that is food. Yeah. Sa is to eat. Gi is a joining particle. Ye is the auxiliary verb. Which sa gi ye makes they they do most of their uh, conjugations on the basis of auxiliary verbs. Mm -hmm. I go to sleep. Ni kugidu. Ni is sleep. Kuba is kind of to sleep. To s mm. So, of course, it's not I myself who don't go to sleep. Or in Tibetan? Uh, this is always implied. implied. It's in many sentences you, you can do very well by leaving the I out, referring mm -hmm. uh, not to a specific person. Everybody knows it, you're meaning yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can say nga kalasagi, I am eating. You put the nga, nga means I. You put that in front, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you leave it away, everybody understands. It's also f mostly spoken that way. You, it, only if it refers to explicitly you want to state I am now eating, then you would add the I. But the expression like I hate you is uh, there is in Tibetan language. <laughs> You can say I don't like you, can go uh, Hatred rises. You just say, the other one says something very uh, annoying, and then the reply will be, hatred is rising. Hatred is rising? rising. Yeah, yeah, troll langido. Hatred is rising. It's rising. It's rising. So like an objective, observable inner phenomenon. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Not as I am. Uh, no, no, no. Ha hatred. So uh, hatred is rising. Rising. And then implied in me. This means that I love you is translated in love is rising. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. you. Cannot say it even. There's no way. No way. No way to say I love you with all the implications we have. Okay. Absolutely no way. So the, the equivalent will be? Uh, you, love means pure love. Wishing for the happiness of all beings. Mm -hmm. And this we try to develop towards all beings. And that is Maitri in Sanskrit or Champa in, in uh, Tibetan. Champa, your name. It's my name, yes. yes. It's my master's name. Yes. Actually, actually directly uh, through an emanation of Buddha Maitreya. Who was called uh, Jamba Purchogrim, a very, very extraordinary master. So, uh, this is a word you use not in colloquial language, it is uh, an aim of developing this noble quality of mind. So, this you will never use for love or kind of liking others. You can say, Gabo, I, I appreciate you, I like you. But the implication of I love you, that I desire you, is so unspeakable, nobody will use that word. You can say that, I desire you, but that is really low. 
and they, Tibetans have a very fine way of expressing themselves. So this you will not say. Also the implication of I have fallen in love means uh, my mind got disturbed. So it, already the, the word used impl implies that it is a disturbed state of mind. Quite, quite a different world created by those realities. And, and, so the Tibetan language is based on uh, a, a very profound psychology. Exactly. So when somebody loses his head, yeah. head uh, falling in love, is disturbed, yes, is in disturbed. a confusion state, <laughs> yes, in a exactly, way. Exactly. Uh, allowed me, Venerable Jampa Lungtok, to offer you um, the fourth volume of our project, uh, an Education and uh, Cultural Diversity. In fact, it's very connected. And you are, you are here in, oh, in, in the... Yes. <laughs> uh, the, with the last, uh, last year's interview. Um, and... Uh, uh, thank you, thank you again for uh, for for being uh, here. I think we only have uh, one minute or something. So now, if I I, I may say to somebody, to Tibetan, I love you. I uh, better not. So I say I'm confused. <laughs> My mind is so confused. <laughs> um, but uh, I may say, jampa. Uh, yeah, you say I appreciate you. I appreciate. I appreciate you. the you. Gabo? Gabo, you. Gabo, you. I appreciate. I like. I like. Yes, yes. Champa is not used in everyday uh, colloquial right. language so much. Gabo, you. Gabo, you. Twitchy, che. Na, gabo, che, da, chung. Also, much uh, appreciation has arisen in me. Arisen.